A hundred blocks north of Lewis, Kate is growing up on Manhattan's affluent Upper East Side. These are Kate's friends, Lucy and Alexis. All three girls attend one of New York's most prestigious and competitive Good morning. I'm Michael Kundu. So I'd like to approach this project today a little bit differently. I have selected Kate and her friends Lucy and Alexis for my analysis. And part of the reason that I decided to choose those three was because they come from a lifestyle and an upbringing that is very much unfamiliar and foreign to me. When I grew up, I grew up in India initially where I did have a fairly affluent life, but my parents moved to Germany and then to Canada. And in the course of my upbringing and development after the age of roughly around five, I did not at all experience affluence. That was something that was quite um, unfamiliar to me. And my lifestyle was much similar to some of the other students in this particular documentary. So I thought by approaching this project, by focusing on a unique lifestyle, something that um, I, I didn't have an experience with, that I would learn quite a bit more and I would actually get a chance to see the development and the differences in the way these, these particular children grew up. And for me, that is probably going to be much more valuable, much more educational, and a learning experience as well throughout the process of this particular uh, project. So there you have it, that's my approach, and now let's move directly into the project. So based on what we see in the documentary so far, we can make some assumptions. One is that all three girls are physically normal. There is no visible disability that we see as presented visually to us. Two, all three girls seem to come from the predominant white Anglo-Saxon culture, which also does have an impact on the way they see themselves in their own development. And three, the obvious socioeconomic status is much higher among these three girls than some of their peers might be. And it's also interesting, if you look at some of the, the snippets that we see from Nightingale Academy, the majority, the vast majority, I think, are also like them. They seem to be white Anglo-Saxon predominantly. I think I just saw one minority in one of the segments. But there obviously is another cultural implication of being sort of part of a homogenous culture, and we'll talk a little bit more about that. So let's take a quick look and analyze the, the physical development and stature of the three. And then comparatively, let's also take a quick look at the, the social hierarchy or the level of dominance or submissiveness among the three, Lucy, Kate, and Alexis. I have a question I'll to ask you. Please. What if someone came over and said, hey, and he's like a boy, and he says, hey, try a drug, try a cigarette, and then you say, no, I would or not, and then he sticks it in your mouth. What do you do? So at this stage, physiologically speaking, there seems to be a pretty clear-cut hierarchy among the three. You look at Kate, she seems to be the smallest in stature, whereas Alexis seems to be the tallest. And Lucy, although she seems to be the middle-sized person, physiologically at least, it seems as if she shows a very strong level of dominance over the other two. You can see in her posturing, when she's actually in this discussion with Kate and Alexis, she leans right over Kate. She seems to kind of almost not even think of her being there. So Kate, in response, actually kind of shrinks down and stays very submissive during the whole time. So there's definitely some physiological differences between the three at this stage in their development at age seven. Three girls attend one of New York's most prestigious and competitive private schools. Why they make us wear uniforms is because how they know that we're a Nightingale girl and also because it's a symbol of Nightingale. It's something that Nightingale wants girls to be. So this clip provides us an immediate insight into a couple of basic sociocultural development theories. When we look at Vygotsky's theory about how the immediate circle, how the culture and the particular customs and beliefs of a group basically help establish values and norms. This is a great example because the Nightingale School itself that Kate and Alexis and Lucy go to really have a set standard and it seems as if the girls pick up on that fairly easily. So if you in turn look at Brofenbrenner's ecological systems model, 
Let's take a look at that. Let's take a look at the micro system, which is the immediate circle of friends, the schools, and the relationships that Kate seems to have. And she seems to be heavily influenced by her friends and her environment, which is kind of interesting because it means that the parents are somewhat removed from the equation. But the, the second tier around, based on Broff and Benner's model, is the meso system. So that is the, the main factors that basically establish the the values and the expectations and the beliefs and the conventions that these girls need to develop toward and strive towards are very present. And eventually we'll see as they grow that we move into the exosystem and the macro system around them and their view of what their particular lifestyle or their status in society means and how that may be different to other particular age cohorts. I go to public high school and it's different from Nightingale, from private all girls uniform school. It's n probably not as good academically, but I like the atmosphere a lot more. It's opened up my eyes to the world more because of the di its diversity, both racially and economically, seeing all the different people and neighborhoods and everything. It's made me a more aware person. One of the things that we've learned so far in reading the text by Laura Burke is about fostering resilience in middle childhood. Now Kate particularly, uh, the way she interacts with her peers, she really is easygoing and that's one of the, the characteristics of a child who can foster resilience effectively. That personal characteristics, including an easy temperament and a mastery-oriented approach to new situations, really helps a child deal with adversity in their life. And in this case, when Kate faces the divorce of her parents, the move out of Manhattan into the suburbs where she ends up working with a completely different cohort and going to school with uh, diverse cultures and, and students that completely are different from what she was used to in Manhattan during age seven, she really learns because she has the ability to adapt her submissive character the diminutive nature of how she reacted with her two other peers earlier on in her life has really helped her to shape that capability. A paper by Luther, Crossman, and Small in 2015 indicates that resilience is not a pre-existing attribute, but rather a capacity that develops, enabling children to use internal and external resources to cope with adversity. Well, this is precisely what we're seeing with Kate. She seems to be able to adjust to these, these changes in her life, pretty dramatic ones, a lot easier than what you would expect. In a paper drafted up in 1996 by Francis Abood and Annabeth Doyle, they made the observation that for the most part children develop their societal attitudes about race and they associate white people with power and privilege and other people, minorities, with poverty and inferior status in society. Which is kind of interesting because the reality is even though we don't hear this specifically in the three girls, Kate, Alexis, and Lucy's perspectives about life, it's pretty certain that in the circle that they find themselves in, in New York, in sort of the more affluent society, they do develop that attitude. And later on in different segments, we actually see some of that articulated. The same. But usually there's black people that are homeless because they don't they had to come to America because they couldn't buy anything or anything like that. And black people are sometimes different in the way they act. Like black people come from Jamaica and stuff, they might say, oh, I think it's okay to drink and do cigarettes because in our country that's what we do. And this next segment actually suggests that even though we weren't exposed much to Lucy's parents and how they may have raised her, it, there's almost a manifestation of uh, somebody that you would expect to have undergone an authoritarian child-raising methodology earlier on in their life because she seems to manifest some of those behaviors or the outcomes of that in her middle teen years as well. I'm like a little devil and I'm not I'm such a good kid I'm such a nice person can't even tell you and my teachers like just for some reason I have these problems with authority I, I don't know why I guess it's just like me wanting to be I just hate like having to listen to people when you know that you're right and they're wrong but again that's something that you're gonna have to do in the real world 
watching these segments, you get the impression that Alexis really seems to be driven. Now, you never really figure out whether that might be the parents or if it's coming from her herself, but certainly there's no question that she pushes herself and it seems to take its toll over time. Chapin just puts immense pressure on you to, you know, do well. I mean, even like friends competed with friends like, oh, what'd you get on that test? Um, and you'll be like, oh, I got, you know, uh, you know, B plus or whatever. And they're like, oh, well, you know, I got an A and ha ha ha. From one paper that we find in our Hill and Cheo text, there is a paper by Belkis de Castro and Sofia Cad Sambis, and it discusses parental involvement during the adolescent stage. And they indicate that during high school, many parents become less concerned with the daily supervision of their teens and more concerned with their high school learning opportunities. This is kind of evident in what we see with Alexis' life, because it seemed as if she was driven to get high grades in early school and then going into high school. But really, from high school onward, we see her kind of kind of developing her own desires and focusing on the things she really wants to do. So that might be something that was accented when she didn't make the cut on the swim team because then she could really focus on her own ambitions of becoming a marine biologist. It's hard looking at myself and trying to see why I do certain things and definitely not, I'm never going to be done with that process you now. I'm never going to get my emotional diploma or something like that. No, I'm never going to graduate from that. But, you know, it's, it's a learning process. Now, Alexis is an excellent example of the concept of the stability of temperament, which is something that we've read about in the Burke text, as well as a paper that was produced by Coppola, Sibley, and a number of other authors published in 2018, the discussion of predicting a child's temperament, basically lasting from early childhood, uh, starting after the age of three when the evidence of behavior is actually established, you can predict a child's stability of temperament based on the way they respond to different things as early as three, but onward through early childhood. And I think what we've seen with Alexis is that she's had stability of temperament throughout her entire early life up to the age of young adulthood. And I think that's evident because she seems to have a consistent focus on performing academically, whether that was put in place by expectations by her parents and then emphasized by her own internal mechanisms. We're, we're not entirely sure yet, but I do suspect that to be the case. But she shows that trait right through to early adulthood. And the way that she focuses on the swim team, her commitment to her boyfriend, and especially the amount of effort she puts into school, makes it pretty clear that she does have a stability in certain aspects of her life. Ultimately, she does realize, of course, that life doesn't deliver all the promises that we would hope that it would deliver. So that brings us to a discussion about Lucy and Kate, the two who I thought had the most dramatically different personalities at the beginning. I felt that Lucy, initially, because of her dominant sense and her sort of a sense that she would actually do quite well, but it turned out to be the opposite. She actually seemed to be the most unsatisfied and, and disillusioned person in this study. And Kate, on the other hand, because of her submissive nature, I thought she would end up being completely lost, but ultimately she was the one who set off on a journey to find herself. So this is really kind of an interesting discussion about the concept of neuroplasticity. We, we learned a little bit, bit about the fact that uh, people are shaped by both nurture and nature, but I think in this case, probably the evidence leans to, in this case, the, the study of the three, nurture seems to be the biggest impacting factor too. So we don't know much about their original uh, biological backgrounds, but we do certainly see how much nurture and their, their social development and their social environment created the people that they became in the early adult life. So to me, this was a very interesting study. It was very enlightening in a sense because I didn't realize that people who experienced such a solid, uh, stable foundation as far as affluence is concerned and social stature would ultimately have these kinds of outcomes in the course of their early adulthood. Very interesting, very interesting. I learned a lot from this study.